Chapter 6 Dylan opened his eyes in the morning light to find Kelly sitting cross-legged in the tiny tent. She was holding an envelope. Slowly she straightened out the crumpled paper, pressing it flat. He didn't make a move or a sound, but she looked at him, noticing that he was awake. Dylan remained silent, waiting. Kelly tried to smile, but it was more of a sad grimace. It's a letter from the lawyer. Dylan watched as she played with the paper. I think I know what it says, but I keep putting off opening it. I wanted this weekend to be normal before everything goes to pieces. A tear spilled over her cheek and she wiped it away quickly. Silly. It doesn't change anything. When did you get the letter? Dylan asked gently. Friday. She took a deep breath. I can't win. I don't have money like they do to hire good lawyers. Dylan carefully sat up. He made sure his voice was very gentle. Why don't we just open the letter and then decide what needs to be done based on what it says? We? Kelly looked up at him. Dylan hated to see the vulnerability in her eyes. We. Do you want me to open it? Kelly handed him the letter. Please. He hesitated, but opened it and began to read. He paraphrased the lawyer's speech. Margaret and Terence Islington are suing you for full custody of Bentley Christopher Islington. What? Kelly stared at him in shock. I thought they wanted partial custody. They want full custody. Dylan watched her, worried. Bentley's grandparents. She began gulping in great breaths of air. Kelly held a hand to her mouth and another to her abdomen, tears coming in earnest now. They're going to take him from me. No one is going to take your son. Dylan gathered her in his arms and held her. Kelly shook her head. You don't understand. He's your son. You love him and are doing a good job raising him, Dylan said logically. No judge is going to take Bentley away from you. Kelly had a heartbreaking sob. I work sixty hours a week just to pay rent, and I'm behind. I'm being evicted. I just lost my job for being late to work too many times. The only place we can go to is my mom's, and she's a drug addict and alcoholic. Kelly. Dylan tried to search for the right words to say. We will fight this. I'm going to lose my son, Kelly keened. She cried unconsolably. There was a scuffle of feet and voices outside the tent. She's crying. If he hurt her. Get real, guys. The zipper opened and Tiana crawled in. What is going on? Dylan glanced meaningfully at the paper under Tiana's knee. He smoothed back the hair on Kelly's face as she continued to pour her heart out on him. Tiana murmured to herself as she read the letter. What does it say? The entire group was kneeling at the entrance of the tent. I don't understand. It's all lawyer talk. Tiana looked at Derek. Derek snatched the paper out of her hand and scanned it. He muttered curses. Christopher's parents are suing for full custody and guardianship of Bentley. They cite that they can prove Kelly is an unfit mother. That's just not true, Bex cried. Kelly's a great mom. Can you get the dragon to do pro bono work? Tomlin asked Derek. Derek snorted. Not likely. She's a shark. Your boss is a family lawyer? Dylan asked. The best. She deals with custody battles all the time, Derek said. However, her clientele tends to be rich and able to afford her. Then I will hire her and whoever else we need to, Dylan stated firmly. Kelly is not going to lose Bentley. They decided to pack up camp and go back early. That way, Derek and Dylan could hire lawyers and figure out their best way to defend Kelly against the Islingtons. Kelly sniffed and wiped her eyes. I'm sorry. I shouldn't be crying on you like that. Hey. Dylan turned her face and waited until she looked at him. You are not going to lose Bentley. I promise. You can't promise that, Kelly said sadly. No one can. I'm going to do everything that I can to ensure that Bentley stays with you, he assured her. I can start by talking to someone at the hospital to get your job back. Please don't. Kelly hugged herself. It's not that I'm not grateful for the offer, but you can't just use your wealth and influence to make them hire me back. Why not? 
Dylan frowned as he recalled some of the details that she had shared around the campfire. You were doing your job looking after that guy. It's not okay that they fired you. I knowingly disobeyed hospital policy. I was consistently late to work. Kelly sighed. I'm going to have an even worse track record with my attendance at any new job now that I have to attend court dates. Yes, I don't agree with the hospital's policy that got me fired. Yet as much as I need the job, I don't think it's right to just have you go in and get it back for me. I feel like I would be taking advantage of you. You wouldn't be. I offered to do this for you, Dylan said. I know. Kelly rubbed her face and gathered up her things in the tent. And I would dearly like to accept your offers. However, I might start to depend on you, and then what? What happens when you decide to be over the novelty of hanging out with the poor girl? Or if you decide to further your relationship with Susan Hythe? She definitely won't want you associating with the likes of me. I just can't let myself learn to depend on you, Dylan, because eventually you will leave. Then what happens the next time? I need to figure out how to do this on my own. Dylan watched with some confusion as she grabbed her bag and crawled out of the tent. He had never had anyone turn down his offer of help before, and Kelly desperately needed his help. Derek waited for Cynthia Stone to pick up. He paced the small path around the camp as the rest of the crew packed up tents and made breakfast. Thankfully, he had a cell phone booster. After Tiana had gotten hurt one year, it was policy that at least one of them would be able to call for an emergency help if anything happened. Hello? a sleepy voice asked. Derek looked at his watch. It's 7.30. Since when are you asleep? Since I worked until two in the morning because my assistant went camping, came the sharp reply. I am bogged down in cases. Are you coming back early? Yes, I have a new case for you. Derek could feel the tension of his working life coming straight back at him. He would be popping antacids in no time. Kelly Islington is being sued for custody by the grandparents. No. He could hear Cynthia turning on a coffee machine in the background. Conflict of interest. I was just hired by Margaret and Terence Islington on Thursday while you were processing the Gardner files. Then drop them, Derek said. Kelly needs the best to represent her. I am flattered that you think I'm the best. However, even the best isn't going to get Kelly Islington custody. They have all sorts of dirt on this, Mom. She has just been fired. She's being evicted. She has no money, so it's laughable that you think she could hire me. Derek, she's toast. There's no way she's keeping the kid. Cynthia yawned. She is my friend, he said simply. Then you need new friends, she stated wryly. We have somebody willing to pay the fees for Kelly. Derek tried to persuade her. Drop the Islingtons and take her on. Please? I can't. Cynthia was turning on a shower. He could hear the spray of water over the phone. The contract is already signed. I'm obligated to the Islingtons. Break the contract, Derek suggested. Derek, that's not going to happen. Get yourself back here so we can get some work done. Derek hung up the phone. He really wanted to quit his job right now. Then again, he wanted to quit his job nearly every other day. He grabbed out his wallet and looked at the photo in it to remind himself of why he was putting up with Cynthia Stone. Is she going to take the case? Tiana asked. Derek shook his head and put his wallet away. She has been hired by the Islingtons. What? Tiana was outraged. Yep. Derek grimaced. I am so mad right now. Did you tell her they were the scum of the earth and she needed to work for Kelly instead? Tiana questioned. Derek snorted. Like I said, she's a cold-hearted woman. Cynthia thinks she's going to win. How often does she lose? Tomlin asked. Derek met Tomlin's eyes reluctantly. Never. There's always a first time, right? Kelly dredged up a wobbly smile as she approached. I'm sure I will find a really great legal aid lawyer. Judges usually side with the moms, so that's in my favor. Kelly, they know that you've lost your job, Derek warned. And when were you going to tell us that you were getting evicted? I don't know, Derek. Kelly closed her eyes and rubbed her forehead. Maybe I was a little focused on the fact that I just learned I might lose custody of my son. 
You're getting evicted? Bex echoed. I'm behind on the rent, Kelly said. You work all the time. How can you be behind on the rent? Tomlin wondered. Because every cent I make gets taken by child care, or dentistry, or health insurance, Kelly's voice rose. Or the utilities, because it's nice to have heat in the winter. Don't forget the rent goes up every year while my pay stays the same. Plus, Josh needs things that Mom isn't buying for him, like clothes, school supplies, and groceries. Hey, Tiana wrapped an arm around her. We all know the struggle. I work all the time, Kelly hiccuped pathetically. I just can't get it done. I have no savings, no retirement, no college fund for Bentley. I'm behind on my student loans from nursing, plus my bills from the hospitals for when Bentley was born and when Christopher died. I don't drink or party. I go out with you guys once a year. That's it. I don't spend money on anything but the necessities. I have no idea what I'm going to do. Tiana hugged her as she burst into tears again. Who is Josh? Dylan asked quietly to Tomlin. Her half-brother. He's fifteen, he replied. She takes care of him as well? Dylan questioned. Tomlin put a hand on his shoulder and steered Dylan away from the group. Kelly's mom, Meredith, isn't exactly the best functioning adult. She's an addict. Sometimes she manages to get clean. Her husband, Moose, comes and goes as he gets work. They barely get by. Josh still lives with them, but he hangs out at Kelly's a lot. She still has the bills from Bentley's dad, Christopher. He had cancer. They weren't even married for a year before he died. Kelly was originally hired right out of nursing school to take care of Christopher. When they fell in love and decided to get married, the Islingtons cut Christopher off. They said Kelly was just a hussy and a gold digger. Kelly had to take care of him by herself because the Islingtons wouldn't pay out for any care during the marriage. Anything that wasn't covered by his insurance, she's still paying off. Meanwhile, his folks are rolling in cash, Tomlin said in disgust. They haven't helped with any of Bentley's stuff. They just expect to be able to have him over whenever they want. She turned down my offer to hire a lawyer. Dylan looked back at Kelly, who was still crying on Tiana. She said she didn't want to learn to depend on me. Who has she had in her life that she could depend on? Tomlin grimaced. We are her friends, and she's always hiding behind smiles and a positive attitude, trying to make us feel better. She's never been able to accept help because no one has been there to help her. Well, we're all here to help her now. Dylan looked at Tomlin as he made the commitment. The fact that anyone would want to take a kid from a mom who obviously loved him did not sit well with Dylan. He was glad that Ren's parents had no desire to fight him for custody of Caden and Avery. It was enough that they saw the boys on special occasions. If Dylan had his boys taken away, he wasn't sure what he would do. He couldn't imagine it. Is there any way to hire a lawyer and tell Kelly he comes from legal aid but to buy her a good lawyer? Dylan asked Derek as he and Bo came to join them. Kelly would notice a professional lawyer. Derek grimaced. Legal aid is like drawing from the lottery. There are some really good lawyers there. There are also some poor ones and very inexperienced ones. That's not good enough, Dylan stated flatly. Preaching to the choir, Derek agreed. However, Kelly is stubborn and doesn't want you to pay out for a fancy lawyer if she feels that she can never pay you back. That's not going to help her case, Dylan said tersely. It gets worse. I don't know if you heard, but my boss is working for the Islingtons. Cynthia Stone doesn't pull any punches, Derek scowled. She's going to hone in on the fact that Kelly has no job, no apartment, no prospects. Cynthia's going to make Kelly sound unfit to raise Bentley. Which we know isn't true. Kelly loves Bentley and is a good mom, Dylan defended her. She just needs some financial help. Which she won't accept unless she feels like she's giving something in return. Derek gave a hollow laugh. Kelly is going to lose. How do you figure? Aren't judges partial to siding with moms? Dylan asked. Usually, if the kid isn't in any danger, they do side with the mom and get her the tools she needs to succeed. Derek shook his head. This court date has come up very quickly, which makes me suspect a couple of things. Like what? Dylan questioned. That the Islingtons have made it seem worse than what it is? What sort of evidence have they brought forward to the judge to make this case go so fast? Do we even have a chance of winning when I have all the cash in the world against a destitute mother? 
Derek shrugged. We can bring forward character witnesses for Kelly, but that's not helpful when she doesn't have an appropriate place to live or the means to buy her kid lunch. Dylan exchanged phone numbers with Derek. He assured Kelly's friend that if she needed anything, Derek was to let him know. The mood of the group was somber as they hiked back to the cars. They had dropped Dylan off first at the bar and grill where they had kidnapped him from. It had been a few days and Dylan hadn't heard from them since. He was concerned because he also felt that Kelly was avoiding him. While he had seen Bentley at the school when picking up and dropping off Avery at class, there was no sign of Kelly. Dylan had wanted to touch base with her to see how she was doing, to know if she had found an acceptable lawyer, to offer to pay for one yet again. Dylan felt bad about her situation. He was also a little disappointed. Dylan felt like they'd become friends over the camping weekend, and now he was left out. It was disconcerting. Since he didn't have Kelly's phone number and he knew better than to start gossip at the school by asking the secretary for it, Dylan settled for calling Derek. Hopefully he could get some answers as to what was going on. However, he found that talking to Derek wasn't all that satisfying either. For some reason, Kelly didn't want him to know the exact court date or time. Derek gave him the information, but advised him to show up a little late. He didn't want to get caught out for going behind Kelly's back. Dylan again offered to help financially. Derek promised to try to convince Kelly. They both only wanted to help Kelly. However, it didn't sound like she was going to allow them the opportunity. Derek promised to keep in touch with any further developments. Dylan, for all his wealth, felt a little useless. He wondered when he would next see Kelly. Kelly hurried into the office of the school. She had been in the middle of an interview when her phone had rung. The school was having a problem with Bentley and required her to come in to discuss it. She had blown her chance at the job. It was one of the few interviews that she had been granted in her field. No one seemed to like the fact that she had been terminated from her last job, so Kelly wasn't getting any callbacks. Kelly told herself that she wasn't desperate enough to scrub toilets just yet. She was getting close, though. She pasted on a smile for the benefit of the secretary. Excuse me, I was called in? Please take a seat. Principal Wright will be with you shortly. The secretary gave her a dismissive look and continued clicking away on her keyboard. Kelly took the seat and waited. The custody hearing was only two days away. She had an appointment in an hour to see the lawyer that had been assigned to her for the first time. Mr. Ailes had sounded nice on the phone. She hoped he was a good lawyer. At least he was free. She had five days to get another apartment, move her in Bentley's things, get a job, win a custody court case, and figure out her life. No sweat. Mrs. Islington? Principal Wright stood in the doorway of his office. Kelly put on a smile and followed him into the room. Her smile immediately left when she spotted Susan Hythe. Susan, to what do I owe the pleasure? Susan sniffed. I think Principal Wright should answer. Mrs. Islington, please be seated. He motioned to the chair next to Susan. Kelly pulled the chair a little away from the offending woman and sat. I have had some disturbing news. Apparently, Bentley was swearing at Philip today and threatened to pants him. Bentley doesn't swear. Pants? Philip? Kelly asked in some confusion. What does that even mean? Pantsing someone is when you pull their pants down in public, Principal Wright said. We take bullying very seriously at this school, Mrs. Islington. I understand that, and I'm glad you do take it seriously, Kelly responded. I have a question, though. Did anyone else hear Bentley say these things? Excuse me? Susan jumped in the conversation. My Philip was threatened. He told me so. I'm just asking if there were any witnesses, Kelly said reasonably. Otherwise, it's just Philip's word against Bentley's. Did Bentley admit to threatening Philip or swearing? No, he was adamant that he didn't threaten Philip or say those things, Principal Wright said. We will be investigating further into the matter, including asking if any other students heard the threats. So you didn't do that already? 
Kelly asked. Seems a bit premature to be asking me to come in. I was in the middle of a job interview. Mrs. Islington, we felt it necessary to inform you of events, the principal began, but Kelly interrupted. You haven't done a complete investigation. You haven't asked the other kids what really happened. You took Philip's word over Bentley's. Why? Because my kid is poor and doesn't fit in at Livingston Academy? Kelly rolled her eyes. Oh, wait, did Philip even say anything, or was it just his mommy complaining? Susan gasped. How dare you? Really, Susan? Kelly looked at her in disbelief. This, after what you did at the Ramsleys during Avery's birthday party? Should I let Principal Wright know what Dylan Ramsley caught you doing? That has nothing to do with this, Susan exclaimed, even as she paled in complexion. I think it does. I think you have it in either for me and my kid, or for the kids of First Elementary in general, Kelly stated. I think you want to get rid of us and are stooping to any low method your fertile imagination can come up with. Ladies, Principal Wright said loudly, that is enough. Susan waved her hand dismissively. How absurd. Just admit it, Kelly insisted. You don't think that our kids are as good as yours. Why would they be? Susan laughed. The fact that we are allowing future drug dealers and low-life criminals to mingle with future presidents and lawmakers is crazy. I have no idea why Livingston Academy would ever allow such creatures with barely an education to grace its doors. You are asking for head lice, bullying, vandalism? They blew up the toilets at the former school for pity's sake. This is height that is enough. Principal Wright looked at her in disgust. I think it's time I talked with Philip myself. You can't, Susan said suddenly. I need to take him to the doctor's. Why, so you can coach him on what to say to Principal Wright? Kelly asked dryly. I promise that I won't take up too much of Philip's time. The principal stood. You two ladies can stay here. They watched him exit the room. It's disgraceful, that's what it is, Susan growled. You should all go back to the sewers where you came from. Kelly decided not to say anything. She was angry enough that she might really get into it, and then she'd end up being charged or having Bentley expelled for something she did. Kelly ignored Susan and stared out the window, waiting for Principal Wright to come back. Principal Wright closed the door behind himself and sat down at his desk. He folded his hands. After careful questioning, I was able to determine that while Philip understood the term pantsing, he wasn't familiar, nor could he repeat the swear words that Bentley had said to him. After a few more questions, he admitted that he had been put up to accusing Bentley of this misconduct by his own mother. Mrs. Hythe, do you have anything to say for your behavior? This school needs to purge the first elementary students from Livingston Academy, Susan stated firmly. My Philip had head lice. These children bring disease with them. We need to protect our kids. Mrs. Hythe, the principal sighed. I'm going to suspend Philip for a week for falsely accusing another student. I hope he will come to understand the gravity of the situation you have put him in. I am also revoking your special privileges with this school. Due to your dishonesty, I will not have you on or leading any of our special committees. That's it? Kelly snorted. She gets out of PTA meetings? Mrs. Islington, it is an appropriate punishment, Principal Wright said. No, it's not, Kelly protested his decision. If my son had been found guilty, I guarantee the police would be involved for threatening another student. He would be lucky to get a week suspension. This kid gets to threaten my son's education by falsely accusing him on the advice of his mother, and all he gets is a week suspension, and she gets kicked out of parents' clubs? That's ridiculous. Mrs. Islington, please calm down, Principal Wright implored. I don't think so. Kelly grabbed her cell phone as it beeped an alarm. You are lucky. I need to go right now to visit my lawyer for a custody hearing. If I were rich... With a real lawyer? I would sue the both of you right now, so count your blessings that I'm poor and basically powerless. Kelly grabbed her bag and stormed out of the office. She took the shuttle to the bus stop and the bus to the legal aid office. Even though she was right on time for her appointment, she ended up waiting for an hour before Mr. Ailes, her new lawyer, was able to see her. It was probably a good thing, she reflected ruefully. 
because it had taken all that time to stop simmering in fury over the episode at Livingston Academy. Now her anger was replaced by nerves. She had never had to deal with court cases or lawyers before. Mr. Ailes was tall and thin with a long tie. Kelly wondered if he bought them from a special store. She shook his hand gratefully and took a seat at his small office. The office barely contained a tiny desk, two chairs, a laptop, and piles of files. "'Mrs. Islington, I've looked over your file, and I have to say I'm very optimistic,' Mr. Ailes began. "'It seems like this is a routine custody battle where the grandparents feel that your son would be better served to live with them. However, I have found the courts tend to rule in the mother's favor, and you have several things going for you. You're not an addict. You did have a steady job for a number of years before you were fired.' "'I assume you're looking for a new one?' "'Yes,' Kelly answered anxiously. "'I have left my resume with numerous employment agencies.' "'Good,' Mr. Ailes smiled and smoothed down his tie. "'How is your living situation, your accommodations?' "'I am being evicted by the end of the month,' Kelly was truthful. "'I'm hoping to find a new place, "'but I will likely need to stay with my mother until I save up enough money.' "'Okay, so you have the support from your mother.' Mr. Ailes wrote something in the file. What is her reputation like? Kelly grimaced. She's not the best. She is an addict. Has she tried treatment before? Yes, Kelly nodded. She hasn't found it very successful. Even if she would go into rehab again, it would show that she is making an effort, Mr. Ailes said. I would strongly suggest signing her up again and making sure she gets to the clinic. The judge will appreciate that she is trying. Kelly nodded. She didn't have faith that it would make any difference in Meredith's life any more, but if it meant that the judge would look more favorably on Kelly, keeping Bentley, she would do whatever it took. "'I think we have a good chance, Mrs. Islington. You have raised Bentley for eight years. He has no history of abuse. You have no history of substance abuse. You have been a stable parental figure during all that time. Yes, you're going through a rough patch right now,' he allowed. "'However, you have a plan.' Many times, judges will allow women who live in shelters to keep custody, so I think this shouldn't be a problem at all. Kelly sighed in relief. You have no idea how much I needed to hear that. Mr. Ailes gave her a kind smile. Dress neatly for the court date. You will have to bring Bentley. He will sit with a court-appointed child care professional during the hearing. Make sure you are early. Thank you, Mr. Ailes. Kelly shook his hand. She was very glad that she had been assigned this kind man who appeared to have her best interests at heart. "'I am sure everything will be fine,' he reassured her. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look forward to the next chapter of Reluctant Husband. Also, please like this video. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you.